I call this meeting of the Environment, Natural Resources, Finance, and Policy Committee to order. A quorum is present. Uh, Representative Edelson, would you like to make a motion to move the minutes for March 19th? That is my motion, Madam Chair. Representative Edelson moves the minutes for March 19th, 2024. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The minutes are approved. Uh, First on the agenda is Representative Hansen's bill, House File 4625. Representative Hansen, would you like to move the bill? I will move that House File 4625 be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. Representative Hansen to the bill. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. This bill uh, went through the Ag Committee and came here. Uh, it is looking at what the state uh, does for purchases with nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. Uh, and this will uh, look at that assessment. What do we purchase as, a state, as state agencies? Note that that's only state agencies. We're not talking about school districts. We're not talking about other local units of government. And then setting a goal of reducing nitrogen fertilizer use by 25% from that level first reported. So it's primarily going to be things like turf applications. So I'd ask for your support. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to testify on this bill? I see Mr. Johnson approaching. Please state your name for the record um, and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, for the record, my name is Tom Johnson, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution C Control Agency. I um, have had a, a brief discussion with um, the author on this. Um, we would just suggest uh, that the uh, agency in charge of this be the Department of Administration, only because they handle our purchasing um, as a, across the enterprise and would be also more appropriate to uh, look at how to reduce as an enterprise the, the types of purchases uh, as it relates to this or uh, you know other areas that we purchase. So um, I've talked to the Department of Administration about that and they are also supportive of that change. So just for the author to consider. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Johnson. Anyone else who'd like to testify? Uh, we'll go to member discussion. Any member questions or discussion? Uh, Representative Hansen, any closing comments? Um, I think, you know, when we're talking about nitrogen and nitrates, uh, having a comprehensive look at all factors, we should look at what we are doing as a state. So. Ask for your support, and if anybody wants to co-author it, it'd be great. I renew my motion to lay over 4625 uh, for possible inclusion. Representative Hansen removes his, renews his motion that House File 4625 be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. The bill is laid over. Next on the agenda is House File 4420. Uh, Representative Hansen, would you like to move the bill? Yes, I would move uh, House File 4420. This is the what has no, normally been called like the Game and Fish Bill. It's a DNR agency bill, um, and I would move that 4420 be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. And Representative Hansen, I believe you have an A2 author's amendment. Would you like to move the amendment and explain it? Uh, yes, I'd move the A2 amendment to get the bill in the shape I would like. Uh, this is uh, uh, technical language that came from the department. Uh, to make sure we're uh, being consistent, and I would ask for your support to get the bill in the form I would like. Representative Hansen moves the A2 amendment to get the bill in the form the author would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the A2 amendment is adopted. Representative Hansen, to your bill as amended. I have uh, Mr. Rivers from the DNR to walk through the bill as amended. Welcome back to the committee, Mr. Rivers. Please state your name for the record um, and then walk through the bill. Madam Chair, members, thank you for the chance to speak with you today. My name is Pat Rivers, Deputy Director for the Division of Fish and Wildlife with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. As Representative Hansen said, this is our annual game and fish bill. I'd like to walk through the fisheries provisions first. Um, there are 42 sections related to native rough fish, and, and these are the same provisions you heard in House File 4015, uh, your bill, Madam Chair, on native rough fish. Uh, these provisions would uh, address recommendations from a legislative report on native rough fish, uh, changing the definition from rough fish to native rough fish, providing some value for these fish that have been uh, maybe neglected in the past. There are a number of other aspects of this, um, of these sections that I'll, I'll defer to Tyler Winter coming up to speak after me. 
Another section in the fisheries component are two uh, sections 28 and 29 relate to special and experimental fishing regulations. This change adds flexibility to public input requirements for proposed special and experimental fishing regulations, waiving in-person meeting requirements when other meaningful options exist. The last two sections related to fisheries include sections 43 and 44. These changes would simplify the state's trout fishing statutes, clarify that the reg required continuous fishing season only applies to channel catfish and not flathead catfish, and finally that sturgeon can be caught and released lawfully. Moving on to the wildlife uh, provisions of this bill, uh, the agency worked with the Taxidermy Guild to uh, work on sections 12, 16, 17, and 19. These provisions would allow um, hunters to, to bring in whole cervid heads, uh, deer, moose, and elk into the state if they were brought into a licensed taxidermist within 48 hours of returning to Minnesota. In addition, taxidermists would need to uh, dispose of their waste into a lined landfill as a means of trying to manage the, the disease risk from diseases like chronic wasting disease. Section 25 relates to blaze orange on ground blinds. This was a provision that passed last year and, and we'd like to clarify that blaze orange requirements for ground blinds used on public lands is really only related to deer hunting and does not apply to turkey, waterfowl, or bear hunters. Section 27 is a provision related to elk management. This change would repeal the current statutory language connecting the size of Minnesota's elk herd to elk damage payments, thereby giving the DNR greater authority to manage and potentially increase Minnesota's elk herd. I will say that any increase in elk populations requires strong public support and working with agricultural producers to prevent or limit damage caused by elk. And, and nothing in that, in that change in Section 27 is removing the requirement for the public meeting that is already in statute. The final two sections, Madam Chair, are 21 and 22, and they relate to creating an apprentice trapper certification program. This change would allow uh, new trappers to uh, purchase a license if they were accompanied by a licensed trapper over the age of 18 while setting or tending traps. It's a chance for them to try trapping without having to take the education program. Madam Chair, that is a quick summary of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Next on my list of testifiers is Tyler Winter, Native Fish for tomorrow. Welcome back to the committee, Mr. Winter. Please uh, restate your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, it's good to be back. Uh, my name is Tyler Winter. I am a founding member of Native Fish for Tomorrow and an active member of the Isaac Walton League of America. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today in favor of House File 4420 with the language from 4015, the first comprehensive native fish conservation bill in the country. In 1875, the first fish commissioner's report grouped sturgeon and pike along with, quote, the vermin of the waters. In 1909, this idea became law when the phrase rough fish was first used in statute. Now, after 149 years, we are finally able and ready to apply scientific management to native fish in accordance with the North American model of wildlife management. Scientific management is one of seven principles of the North American model. Other principles include Wildlife is conserved and held in trust for all citizens. Wildlife is allocated according to democratic rule of law. Wildlife may only be killed for legitimate purposes. Wildlife is an international resource and every person has equal opportunity under the law to participate in hunting and fishing. One year ago, I testified in favor of the no junk fish bill which required the DNR to report on the legal status and conservation needs of designated rough fish. And the native fish provisions before us are the result of a year of hard work by stakeholders, conservation groups, and the DNR scientists who participated in this work group. The current rough fish statutory def definition includes one invasive species and 26 native species. And scientific management requires native fish to be conserved and invasive species to be minimized. So therefore we must legally separate native fish from the invasives so we can manage our native fish, protect their habitat, and enforce our existing laws. And legal reforms are necessary to conserve our native fish because current regulations provide more protections to minnows, leeches, crayfish, and empty mussel shells than to native rough fish. In fact, actually the season on empty mussel shells is currently closed. This bill extends some of those protections to native rough fish, but not closed seasons because we want these fish to be available to people. In accordance with the North American model of wildlife management, every person will continue to have the opportunity to harvest native rough fish. Thank you, I'm prepared to take any questions about fish or otherwise. 
Thank you for your testimony. Next on my list is Caitlin Rutt from the Minnesota State Cattlemen's Association. Welcome to the committee. Um, feel free to get settled. When you are, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Caitlin Root, and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota State Cattlemen's Association. I'm here today to testify against Section 27 of House File 4420, the repeal of elk herd population caps in certain counties. This section repeals language prohibiting an increase in the elk herd population in Kitson, Roseau, Marshall, Beltrami counties, and will give the DNR authority to potentially increase these elk herds, even if crop and fence damage claims have been increasing. According to the DNR, any increase in elk population goals requires strong public support and working with agricultural producers to prevent or limit damage caused by elk. I can tell you that cattle producers we represent do not support an increase in elk herds in the state of Minnesota. Elk can cause considerable damage to crops, fencing, and stored forage. This statute is here for a reason to ensure ag producers are protected from the considerable damage elk can cause on their farms and ranches. Elk damage claims have not decreased or remained stable the past two years. In fact, they nearly doubled from fiscal year 2022 to fiscal year 2023. According to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, payments made by the department to producers with documented damage from elk in fiscal year 2022 totaled nearly $125,000, and fiscal year 2023 claims totaled over $263,000. And the number of claims from fiscal year 2022 to fiscal year 2023 increased by about 68%. There are $155,000 of funds set aside each year for elk damage payments for producers. Fiscal year 2023 exceeded this $155,000 by over $100,000, which meant the department had to pull funds from the allotted wolf depredation funds to reimburse producers for elk damage claims. Since the mid-1990s, the Minnesota DNR personnel have conducted annual aerial elk surveys from mid-January to mid-March in northwest Minnesota. The 2023 surveys included the Griegla, Kitson Central, and Caribou Vita survey blocks. The Griegla survey block observed 29 elk, Kitson Central survey block observed 75 elk, and the Caribou Vita survey block observed 227 elk. There are minim these are minimum counts, and there is a likelihood some animals are missed with this method. With that being said, these populations meet or exceed the DNR's population goals. Increasing elk populations at a time with soaring elk depredation claims seems contradictory. I ask you to not forget about agricultural producers as you consider the statutory change. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify on this bill? Next, we'll go to questions from members. Uh, Representative Burkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you to the testifier. She hit everything I was gonna ask and more. Um, but to Pat, oh, Pat's there. Thanks, Pat. Um, to the DNR, I'm, I'm just curious um, about the public input locally. I know the Elk Management Work Group was formed back in 2009. Um, I'm getting calls, of course, um, all week. And I'm just curious. I know, you know, I'm looking back at 2009's listed goals. And, and number two is increased landowner acceptance of elk on the landscape by addressing and resolving landowner concerns. And, I think what I'm hearing back home from the folks uh, in Kitson County in particular is uh, I, I know there's been public input, but just can you tell me about the conversation you feel you've had, what you're hearing from folks back home from your side, because I'm getting inundated with calls at home. Mr. Rivers. Madam Chair, Representative Burkle, um, we did meet with the Elk, North, Northwest Elk Working Group on November 15th and again on February 2nd. We've had other conversations, as a matter of fact, just today we met with the Cattlemen's Association, our, our previous testifier with, with wildlife staff, talking about how can we work together on, on solving some of the issues. Uh, we've been meeting with the Department of Agriculture uh, informally, talking about how we can improve programs, programs where there are no applicants for grant programs to help provide um, relief, if you will, for some of the damage that, that's happening in the Northwest, and we've also been meeting with soybean growers to talk about other damage, not just related to, to elk, but there's a true interest by the agency, by the DNR, as well as Department of Ag, to use the programs that we have, make them better, and where we don't have existing programs that work, find other ones that will. Uh, are the conversations complete? Absolutely not. We have a long way to go. 
but we are, are earnest in our desire to work with the agricultural community as well as the conservation community on how we can manage elk in Minnesota. Representative Burkle. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm just curious. I know it was kind of discussed from our testifier about the size of the herds uh, from the aerial surveys lately. Mm -hmm. But what's the goal? I mean, long run, what has been the goal size, and where where are we going here? How how many elk are we talking about? Um, my folks up there are asking that question. Madam, Mr. Rivers. Madam Chair, Representative Burkle, part of that is unknown. We we want to have discussions about what would that look like. But I can give you some some past uh, goals. For the Grigler herd, it's currently at 30 to 38 animals, and we are, I believe it was 28 that were counted in, in 2023. We know that several of those animals have died either through hunting or through car collisions or natural mortality. Kitson Central, the goal is 50 to 60 animals. In 2016, the working group actually had come up with a recommendation of 65 to 75 before the language was changed, uh, capping it at 60 animals. We were not able to actually implement that herd goal of 65 to 75. The caribou vita whole herd, which is the one we timeshare with, with Manitoba, is 150 to 200 for the, for the entire herd. Uh, this past year, there were 96 in Minnesota and 131 in Manitoba. Um, so in terms of what does that number look like going forward, I think it's about having conversations and, and how depredation programs might benefit ranchers and producers to change attitudes about elk. Representative Burkle. And I'll, thank you, Madam Chair, I'll finish up with this, but you know, it was already mentioned, you know, nearly doubling the claims in the last year. Um, and of course, stealing from the wolf depredation fund. I just, I'd like to know for sure that as we move ahead, the DNR is gonna help um, kind of advocate as we move into, I know I've talked to Chair Vang about this in ag, um, but we need to see that the dollar figure in that fund increase substantially if we're gonna increase the herd substantially. And that just needs to be understood. We've already had, I think roughly 30 wolf claims. I mean, we're, we're ahead of the, the curve on wolf, wolf claims up there already. That's a whole other conversation we can have later. But we're stealing money from that fund to, to fix the, the elk herd population problem. And uh, I, I just would like to know that the DNR is gonna help us uh, moving forward in the ag community to increase that. I'd like to see a double at least. Um, and, and not only that, but the cap at $20,000 for crop damages and 1,800 for fences, just not gonna be enough. Um, I know many guys up there that have had, you know, three, four, five claims. Um, $1,800 doesn't go very far with fencing these days. So if you could just go on the record saying I, you'd support helping us see that happen. I, my guys up there are just saying we have to, we have to have that fund increased. Mr. Rivers. Madam Chair, Representative Burkle, absolutely. Uh, the agency has a legislative liaison that meets very frequently with the ag community and, and our wildlife staff are as well. We had, you know, I think we had three or four wildlife staff meeting with cattlemen's today to, to start those conversations and to, to listen. We need to listen to what what works for them and what, what does not. So look for common solutions. So yes, you have our support to, in 2025 to come forward with a, a package that hopefully meets more, more needs for, for wildlife as well as for producers. Representative Scraba. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for uh, Mr. Winter. Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Winter, um, do you know who determines what a native, what's determined as a native fish? Mr. Winter. Yes, thank you for the question. So there is a list in rule of prohibited and uh, regulated invasive species. And so um, that uh, makes it pretty clear which ones are uh, which ones are native and which ones are invasive. So the common carp, Cypernus carpio, is on that regulated invasive species list. Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guide canoe trips in northern Minnesota, Quetico, and the smallmouth bass are considered invasive. Mm -hmm. My question is who picks and chooses what native is and where? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just concerned because some people like the fish and don't want it to go away. Others are like, take them away. And who has the final outcome? Other than what's said on a piece of paper, who decides that? Thank you, Madam Mr. Chair. Winter. Uh, thank you, uh, Scra uh, Representative Scrabble, for that excellent question. Um, the thing is, is that 
we live in an we live in an imperfect world where we have to put things into categories to manage them and to make the regulations uh, understandable. Um, and so this native rough fish category is is really it's a regulatory group more so than it is a biological fact. Um, you can look at the species in this in this category and they're very divergent biologically. Um, you know, from my personal point of view, um, I understand we're never going to get smallmouth bass out of the boundary waters. Um, and so I think I take a pretty broad scope as far as just the political boundaries of Minnesota, um, you know, if it was here. But what we're really talking about here is, is removing protections for common carp and separating out our native species that eat zebra mussels and so on and so forth. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's fine. Representative. Uh, thank you, Chair, and maybe this is to the DNR. Um, can you talk about the level of engagement that you have with our tribal communities, especially around the elk management plan? And just looking at the handout that was provided to the committee, uh, do you talk about you know working, trying to get uh, stronger public support and working with agricultural producers? And so to what extent are you working with our tribes? Welcome back to the committee, uh, Mr. Rivers. Uh, state your name for the record and then help us out with this question. Madam Chair, Representative Lee, uh, we have been working a lot with, with tribal representatives, most, most closely with the uh, Fond du Lac Band. As you know, the legislature appropriated $2.3 million for the uh, possible relocation of elk from northwestern Minnesota to Carleton County. So we've been working closely with, with uh, staff at, at the Fond du Lac Band. We've also informed the 11 tribal nations about our plans and trying to work toward that goal. And there's been a lot of interest there. As you know, we've been working with the Red Lake Band as well. Uh, over the last two seasons, they've been hunting elk. I believe last year they harvested 11 elk uh, from that Kitson Central and, and Grigla herds. So in short, yes, we are working with, with tribal representatives and nations. Uh, Representative Vang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for your testimony. I think, um, I think some of the points raised by uh, Representative Burkle uh, are, are valid uh, to an extent where it, I'm concerned about potentially increasing the claims that also affect my uh, committee's budget. And so I, I will like to follow up uh, to have a more deeper conversation about uh, uh, these, uh, this change here um, to see what that could look like. So this, just a comment, Madam Chair, thank you. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Deputy Director Rivers, so other than the, what I think is reasonably characterized as concerning issues related to the elk issue in this bill, are you aware of any other opposition to any of the provisions that are in 4420? Mr. Rivers. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Representative Heinzman. I am not aware of any, any concerns that have been brought to our attention at this time. I, Kitson County, I believe, uh, was on record stating they opposed Section 27. And I believe that's related to the agricultural issues. Nothing further. Thank you. Um, any further discussion on the bill? Representative Hansen, closing comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have some time to work on this, so I... Uh, and renewing my motion in House File 4420 be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 4420, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill, and the bill is laid over. Next on the list is House File 4214. Uh, Representative Hansen, would you like to move your bill? I would move House File 4214 uh, be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. To the bill, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. House File 4214 is another in our spectrum of nitrogen uh, efforts. Uh, as you know, we did a very large investment in fish hatcheries last year. Uh, so looking at, again, what is the public uh, infrastructure that we have with water, um, if we can build in water quality monitoring at those state fish hatcheries, particularly at the beginning, those that we are just upgrading, like the Waterville fish hatchery. So, uh, also some in the southeast. So uh, that is what 4214 is. Uh, we do have a fiscal note on this um, and it, it has 
uh, defined a bit on assumptions and how we would do the monitoring. We're continuing to work with the DNR uh, on trying to get the best uh, way to start this so we can monitor water quality at the fish hatcheries, both going in and going out. Great. Um, first on my list of testifiers is Shannon Fisher, DNR. Welcome to the committee. Mr. Fisher, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Shannon Fisher. I am the Fisheries Populations and Regulations Manager for the Division of Fish and Wildlife at the Department of Natural Resources. We operate four year-round cold water fish hatcheries and 11 seasonal cool water hatcheries uh, that produce walleye, muskie, northern pike. Clean water is obviously a critical component of the work that we do. At our three cold water trout hatcheries in Fillmore and Winona counties, the DNR collaborates with the Department of Agriculture uh, to monitor for nitrates and 187 different chemical compounds. Uh, MDA staff collect water samples at Crystal Springs, Peterson, and Lanesboro hatcheries annually in June and or September of each year and provide the DNR with an annual water quality report. The three southwest or southeast sorry, hatcheries uh, and our Spire Valley hatchery also have national pollution, pollution discharge elimination system permits through the MPCA. Uh, the conditions of these permits require DNR to complete monthly monitoring for uh, biological oxygen demand, several nitrogen-based compounds, pH, total phosphorus, and total dissolved and suspended solids. At the Waterville Hatchery, we conduct quarterly monitoring for some of those same components. And at the remaining 10 seasonal hatcheries, nine of which operate for less than six weeks per year, water quality is monitored on an as-needed basis. Uh, water quality management is a concern and several of the planned get out more investments are already pointed at hatchery water quality improvements. Uh, as we move forward, uh, we have some questions about the targeted outcomes and scope of the bill, such as the intent to include seasonally operated hatcheries, the spectrum of water quality parameters to be monitored, and the definition of continuous monitoring. We want to work with Representative Hansen on concerns he has related to water quality and provide information from a hatchery system where feasible. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify for or against this bill? Questions from members? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, help me out. So it sounds like we're already doing quite a lot of water quality monitoring. Um, and, um, I guess my first question I'll start with is, considering what you're already doing, um, maybe you can help us know, do, do we support this bill? Do you support this bill? Does DNR support this bill? Mr. Fisher. Madam Chair, uh, committee members, the, the DNR, Department of Natural Resources supports that we can provide uh, water quality data because we have the opportunity to do so. Um, in our four cold water hatcheries, we, we, these are flow through facilities that are operating 12 months a year, out of the year. Uh, so we have an opportunity to do some long-term monitoring, probably more so than we are already doing. Um, at our seasonal hatcheries, I, I think it's a conversation we have to have with the author in terms of what the intent is, um, in terms of the scope. Uh, of how of what what parameters need to be sampled or are desired to be sampled and I think we have opportunities to do so that we have not done so in the past most of the hatchery water monitoring uh, is associated with temperature temperature is our, our most critical factor and uh, so we we have opportunities to do some additional monitor monitoring that's for sure yes representative Heinzman thank you madam chair representative Hanson is there a reason we have to have this bill? Is there a way that there could be some conversations happening without legislation being passed? It just seems like every time we turn around, there's more bills regulating what agencies and private individuals and businesses and just fill in the blank. Every time I, every time I look at the, the committee schedule, I'm starting to wonder, is there, isn't, there, isn't there a way for us to just kind of work without having legislation? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Heinzman. You know, the, essentially what the DNR is doing in some of these cases is grab sampling, where they're pulling a sample and it's quantitative, looking at temperature, maybe it's the, the salt contact, dissolved ob oxygen, those type of physical parameters that impact fish. But nitrates also impact fish. Other quantities, PFAS, may impact fish. So as we've, the standard has been the grab samples and we know that with flow and with time, 
there are different concentrations of different things that come in. And I think the key thing about this is with the fish hatcheries is that these are the public resources. These we own, you know, as the state, um, for the people of the state. So what, what are, what's happening at that? You know, what are we seeing? And so the cost estimate and the question on the, whether it's the short-term uh, intermittent uh, hatcheries versus the cold water, um, you know, that's the cost estimate of how we're doing. We, I think we have, we had a bill in uh, Representative, or Chair Lee's committee about nitrate sensors that were set up to look at things. I remember even 20 years ago now that in the Whitewater River, uh, Representative Jacob, there were automatic sampling stations that were set up. So how do we stay current with technology that may give us better data so it's not the grab sample? Because a grab sample could have a high spike you know, and how do you look at flow measuring versus uh, the actual concentration over time? And then what is the impact that we're having, you know, with the fish on it? So as, as was mentioned, you have the federal permit there and the multiple chemicals that are looked at, we have a new suite of chemicals. And so let's, let's have that assessment of our public resource. That's the reason the bill's here, uh, Representative Heinzman, to get a better picture so we can make decisions on what we're doing for the public. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Hanson, I, I, I appreciate your answer, but at the same time, considering what we just heard from, from DNR in, in the testing that's already happening, you know, I'm left wondering who's asking for this change, because I certainly haven't got a single email in my email or a single phone call or a single text message from sportsmen and women around the state, I think what they're wondering is how many fewer walleyes is there going to be because more regulation because of this bill. I'm, I'm not trying to be obnoxious here, but folks want to be able to go out and catch a fish, and that's what the objective was, and I, I have a feeling it's going to mean a few less fish. Um, maybe there's some argument that there needs to be some kind of enhanced testing, but considering the outcry of, of, of organizations and, and people working to try to get dollars into this category, it seems counterproductive, potentially counterproductive, when you see all the other testing that's already happening and people just want more fish. That's just my thoughts, thank you. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Representative Heinzman, you know, I think, yes, people do want more fish and I, I would never accuse you of being obnoxious, so I don't, don't worry about <laughs> that. Um, but I think they want to be able to eat the fish. They want to be able to eat the fish. And we have standards all over where we recommend not eating fish. And so we better find out on the fish that we're producing if they're safe to eat. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Hansen, are you really suggesting that this water testing in this facility or the water coming out of these facilities is going to impact fish so negatively they can't eat fish? Representative Hansen. Madam Chair, Representative Heinzman, we don't know the answer to that. That's why we would look. Representative Heinzman. Madam Chair, Representative Hansen, we already went through, DNR just told us there's numerous other water tests that are being conducted. I hear, what I'm hearing you say is you don't trust those tests. I don't have any further questions, but I do think the answer isn't really quite what is a reflection of reality. Representative Hansen, closing comments. Madam Chair. Uh, and members, it's really important for us with the public resource to make sure that we are monitoring and doing things right. We have just invested a huge amount of money into fish hatcheries. We need to make sure that they're working. We have technology, we have opportunity, and at a relatively low cost to implement this. It's, just not, it's not just about producing more fish. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 4214 be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. The bill is laid over. Next on the agenda is House File 3624. Representative Hansen, would you like to move this bill? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I would move House File 3624 be laid over for possible inclusion in, in a future bill. And Representative Hansen, I believe you have an A2 author's amendment. Would you like to move the amendment and explain it? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, the A2 author's amendment uh, would affect the fiscal note. It takes money uh, from the private sector matching account for the reinvestment in Minnesota fund that the Commissioner of Natural Resources has 
that has $22 million in it uh, and previously had $30 million in it. It would expend $3.3 million uh, for the transfer for the fiscal note. In addition, uh, this would convert public land that is currently being used for private profit to native veg uh, vegetation, as including but not limited to trees, and that the Commissioner of DNR may be able to quantify carbon sequestration achieved under this act. Representative Hansen moves the A2 amendment to get the bill in the form he would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The motion prevails, the A2 amendment is adopted. Representative Hansen, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to be clear on what this bill does. It is on the commercial production of corn on public lands administrated by the Department of Natural Resources. I would encourage folks to look at the fiscal note and the amount of acres that are being uh, grown on, to corn. Uh, we have talked for years about encouraging carbon sequestration. We've talked about cover crops. We've talked about uh, trying to encourage activity on private lands. I believe this is the simple, single one thing that could transfer and encourage more carbon sequestration on public lands that we already own. We already own them. And the issue of using the public property for private profit, this would make a public purpose of converting these to native vegetation into trees for the long term. The public owns these lands. And to try to be able to quantify that for carbon sequestration because it takes long term vegetation to store carbon. So I think this is a, if we were going to do one thing to impact carbon sequestration through planting, we could do it on the land we already own rather than trying to spend the millions that we're already spending, keep spending those, on encouraging changes of management on private land. That's the bill. First on my list of testifiers, Amanda Billick from the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. Welcome back to the committee. Feel free to get settled and then please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chair Jordan and members of the committee, my name is Amanda Billick. I'm the Senior Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. MCGA represents 7,000 family farmers who grow corn. In, um, uh, to start with, uh, just to say we are opposed to House File 3624. Uh, in previous discussions with the Department of Natural Resources, it's our understanding there's about 12,000 acres under cooperative farming agreements or lease agreements uh, with farmers. And one third of those agreements approximately include corn or impact corn. Uh, and the majority of these agreements between DNR and farmers are to provide food plots for wildlife on public land. Uh, in recent years, I have heard from more and more of our members, specifically down in southeast Minnesota, who have become concerned about some crop damage and yield loss from wildlife, uh, mostly deer eating their crops. Uh, we have received increased requests from members to pursue some discussions with the DNR on possible depredation payments, or if there are other uh, management options uh, that could be pursued to address some of this crop damage in this part of the state. So one of our concerns with banning corn on state land is it could increase the pressure on deer or other wildlife looking for sources of food on private cropland acres. We would also question why this ban is only uh, limited or applies to corn. There are other crops that are covered in the farming agreements with DNR, uh, but this bill only targets corn. So if the goal is to increase native vegetation on public lands, why are we not also including other crops? Uh, previous concerns uh, have been raised in prior years about the increase around the use of pesticides, specifically a class of insecticides that were used as treatments on seeds, uh, mainly corn, and planted in state land under these farming agreements. As a policy, the DNR uh, began prohibiting the use of insecticides on state land several years ago, and that was codified into law in 2023. So in closing, we question again why this proposed ban is only uh, for corn and are concerned that if we limit uh, the food sources for wildlife on public land, that this could increase some of the pressure on private lands, searching out some of those food sources and damaging crops. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Next on my list is Pat Rivers, Minnesota DNR. 
Welcome back, Mr. Rivers. Please once again state your name for the record and proceed. Madam Chair, members, Pat Rivers, Minnesota DNR, Deputy Director for Division of Fish and Wildlife. Food plots play an important role on WMAs and make up less than 1% of WMA acres. This is a reduction from 1992 when we dedicated 4% of those lands to food plots. In addition to WMAs, the Division of Forestry manages approximately 1,400 acres of forestry lands farmed under agricultural leases. Depending upon when a parcel is acquired by the DNR, corn may be used as part of the restoration process before planting native species. Food plots, including those planted with corn, are used to provide food for wildlife or a desired component by many public land hunters and in some places help keep deer and elk from stored forage during difficult winters. Changes to our cooperative farming agreements, as was just mentioned, uh, occurred in 2017 after a two-year review of farming practices and research. The guidelines now include a prohibition on the use of insecticides and fungicides, minimizing the use of herbicides and no-fall application of nitrogen, movement toward a no-till process with no-fall tillage allowed, and finally incorporating more multi-species mixes utilizing cover crops. We are working on a WMA and AMA system plan that is in part addressing how we improve food plot use. This includes using more cover crops that foster soil health. If, H, if House File 3624 became law, we would anticipate challenges transitioning all corn-related food plots to prairie in one growing season. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify on this bill? Uh, first, we'll go to questions from members. First on my list is Representative Jacob. Uh, thank you, Chair Jordan. So this issue would be very problematic in my district. Just to give you a little bit of background, in the 1940s, that's when the DNR came in and proposed to buy the majority of the state land in the area. Prior to that, you know, our family farms uh, out in the ridge there been around since the 1800s. So part of the way that the DNR was able to get farmers to agree to sell the land was that there would be this cooperative uh, farming agreement that would go forward because of the wildlife especially. So to the, and, and my uncle Arnold, 90 years old, still alive. Uh, he was 20 years old when the DNR came in and, and, and bought these uh, area lands. Uh, Jacobs decided not to sell to the DNR, but our farm is 90% surrounded by DNR, as many of my neighbors are. And there's been times I've counted more than 70 deer roaming across my field, eating my crops. So for the DNR to not even make an attempt to try to feed those deer, I mean, that's going to be met with... Uh, <laughs> It, the, the farmers in the area are just not going to accept that. And the DNR and the farmers in the area traditionally try to be good neighbors. We try to get along with each other. We understand that there's, it's not a, a, a straight border. These are intermittent. They're, my land is in the DNRs. The DNRs land is out in the uh, farming areas. It's not just like a border. These are inter, intermixed, intermingled areas. So this is problematic it it feels like you're like an attack on on the farmers in the area in my district especially um, I couldn't really tell for sure I mean it sounds more or less like the the DNR probably uh, doesn't support the bill by and large and I'm also wondering uh, representative Hansen with respect to you saying corn acres well these farms are rotated, so their crop rotation. So we don't have just areas of corn and areas of uh, alfalfa or areas of beans. We're farming this in best management practices like we do everywhere else. So how do we pick out the particular corn acres out of a, a farm that's being rotated and managed with best management practices in the DNR area? So if you could answer that question to start with. I'll just remind members that we don't call other members' motives into question. I know we got a little close, but we're, we're still good, so let's just keep it that way. Um, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the committee. This is public land. I, I keep hearing it being as our land or our farms. This is public land, 12,000 acres in our state. 12,000 acres. 
of public land. Representative Jacob. So another issue that's important in my area is CWD. And when we don't feed deer through crop plots, they end up congregating in farmer's feed storage areas. That produces more issues with CWD. Are, do you have concerns about uh, trying to prevent CWD, which this appears like it would uh, promote CWD? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Jacob, I think it actually gets to a point of support for the bill because if the DNR is on public land, has contracts where corn is planted, and I believe some of the more recent history and data on food plots is that they can be, they're not the, uh, the, the, uh, they're not considered what they once were in terms of habitat for wildlife. And that if you are planting the corn on the public land, that may actually draw that in, draw in wildlife, thus back to the issue on CWD. So um, eliminating corn and having a more diverse, which the DNR said they're already doing some of that, with cover crops and other crops uh, provides a different suite of wildlife that are there. Planting corn to draw deer onto the public land away from private land, <coughs> I, and where does that end? And again, I'll go back to the bill talks about commercial purposes. We've just been talking about food plots, but commercial purposes uh, means harvest. Representative Jacob. Thank you, uh, Chair Jordan. So explain to me how taking crops out of the rotation adds to diversity. Representative Hansen. The corn would draw the deer into those fields. You have different crops in, you have native vegetation, you have trees, you're going to have a, a different suite of wildlife. Representative Jacob. It appears as though there would be one less variety there, which would be less diverse. And la my last question for you is, can you provide any evidence, because I've seen maps of the northern hemisphere during the corn growing season and how much oxygen and uh, activity there is from a plant that grows from zero inches to 14 feet in height at a population of 35,000 plants per acre, what that does for creating oxygen. How, how Do you have any proof that uh, the carbon sequestration from a forest would possibly produce what a corn, um, uh, actively vigorously growing corn crop would produce? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Jacob. I can't, can't cite you specific things off the top of my head, but there is evidence of trees and permanent vegetation with long roots that are over several years storing concentrations of carbon, sequestering carbon, better than annual crops. Because the annual crop, you are, you are using that carbon that has been brought into the plant. So the, it's not being retained because you've taken it off. And now there's more taking it off with both the corn grain and often the corn plant. So I, we can find you, uh, I can look for it and follow up with you later on some of that data, but it's there on trees and permanent or roughly permanent long-term native plants. Sequester carbon better than annual plants. Representative Gilman. I'm good, thanks. Representative Heinzman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just gonna start with um, the amendment lines one, Point four to 1.5 critical habitat private sector matching account 
And I might need DNR, maybe someone else would like to address this, I'm not sure that, maybe Representative, Representative Hanson, you know, but that amendment directs that money from the critical habitat private sector matching account to be used to convert corn plots to native vegetation. Does this type of work fit within the allowable uses of that fund? Representative Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Ms. Taylor. Uh, when we were drafting this, could you reference the section? Ms. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the statute um, for that particular account does allow for restoration, which I believe native vegetation would fall under. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could DNR come back? Mr. Rivers. Madam Chair, Representative Heinzman. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I'm just going to start with Ms. Director Rivers. Do you, do you, does DNR support the bill? Director Rivers. Madam Chair, Representative Heinzman, you know, we, we actually value corn as a, as a tool in food plots, and we'd, we'd like to work on other opportunities to sequester carbon. Uh, we are big in the prairie business. We put a lot of carbon under the ground with our acquisition program. As a matter of fact, the uh, RIM Critical Habitat Match Program, I think within the Division of Fish and Wildlife, we have about $13 million worth of acquisitions that are in the works in that $22 million uh, pot we were just talking about. So I think we agree that sequestering carbon is a good idea. We would love to uh, give a critical look at our 12,000 acres of food plots and see how we can maybe refine that and make that work better for, for not only putting more native habitat on the ground, but also continue to pr provide uh, food plots for, for hunters and for wildlife. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. That, that actually really helps. Nothing further. Any further questions from members? Representative Vang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Rivers, just a quick question. How much of the 12,000 acres are within Southeast Minnesota? Mr. Rivers. Madam Chair, Representative, we have, um, for the Division of Fish and Wildlife, we have 27% of the acres that we have in, in food plots, uh, 2,916 acres. Representative Hansen, closing comments. Thank you, Madam Chair and members, uh, and I'll just kind of go on a theme here. Uh, no one brought me this bill. Um, and we are here as representatives of the people, 43,000 roughly people in our districts. Uh, this is public land. Um, and by having these conversations, we can change the status quo. We have a goal of I hope we have a goal of reducing nitrate contamination in groundwater. I hope we have a goal of trying to have biodiversity. I hope we have a goal of improving carbon sequestration and impacting climate change. I think all of those things can be done by having these conversations and moving this forward. Uh, I'm open to work with uh, the DNR on that implementation and anyone else. Uh, but we have work to do, and this is a way we can do it on our public land, not on the private lands. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 3624, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. And the bill is laid over. Next on the agenda is House File 3418. Uh, Representative Hansen, would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move House File 3418. Uh, this is the DNR policy bill. Um, I move it to be laid over for possible inclusion. And Representative Hansen, I believe you have two authors' amendment. Let's do the A1 first. Could you, would you like to move your A1 amendment and explain it? And there might be a testifier on this. Amendment. Yes, both of these are uh, uh, coming from the agency. The A1, I move the A1 first. Uh, this is uh, relating to uh, Section 10. And uh, DNR is here if anyone has any questions on that. I have John Waters from the DNR here to explain the amendment. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Waters. Please uh, say your name for the tape and then help us out with the A1. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is John Waters. I am the Government Relations Coordinator for the DNR. Uh, so the A1 amendment actually relates to Section 1 of the bill regarding the State Board of Investment. Um, 
this is a, a technical rec correction to make sure that the funds are deposited in the right uh, the special revenue fund uh, for the purposes uh, that those funds are collected. Representative Hansen moves the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form he would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. And I think we're going to hold on the A2 for a second. Is that your intention, Representative Hansen? I think we're going to move it to put it on, but it is going to be uh, open to be changed. I, we do have a testifier on it. So okay. I'll, I'll move a, the A2 amendment uh, to get the, it into the bill because we're laying the whole bill over. Uh, but I, this is uh, uh, when uh, working with Min USA uh, and the Snowmobile Association, they had some suggestions about mufflers. We have attempted to make uh, to incorporate those suggestions. They do have some proposed changes. I believe by adopting the A2, we'll get it into the bill. We'll continue to work on those uh, changes. So. And then, Mr. Waters, did you want to add anything to the A2? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The amendment came from the Minnesota United Snowmobilers Association, and we've been in, in discussions, and uh, they've been in discussions with uh, Polaris uh, to make some tech corrections. Uh, at this time, we support uh, including it in the bill, and we look forward to working with um, the partners to uh, bring this in, in line with what we need. Representative Hansen moves the A2 amendment to get the bill in the form he would like to discuss. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 The motion prevails and the A2 amendment is adopted. Representative Hansen, to your bill as amended. And I'll have Mr. Waters walk through the bill. Mr. Waters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, th this bill was developed uh, to help uh, the DNR manage the state's natural resources adaptively and respond to public input. Uh, the 2024 policy and technical bill focuses on changes related to sustainable forest management, ecosystem management, and improving DNR's business and policy practices. Um, I'll briefly walk through the, the bill as outlined. Uh, section one of the bill relates- Mr. Waters, can I have you pull the microphone a little bit closer? Thank you. Thank you, proceed. Uh, Section one of the bill relates to a request to allow the State Board of Investment to manage uh, designated accounts and invest money in collected by the DNR as part of financial assurances. SBI managed investments accounts would provide for greater state oversight of funds, reduce investment fees, and help protect future generations of Minnesotans from costs associated with reclamation of mining operations. In short, this provision uh, makes a conforming change to update the statute to reflect where the dollars currently reside in the state's accounting system. Section two provides a process for DNR to deposit net income into the permanent school fund and certified costs to be transferred from the forest management account by June 30th each year. This provides consistency in the timing those funds are transferred and provides a path to certify the costs in the event the commission is unable to meet. Uh, section three of the bill allows the agency to request the Department of Administration to allow the sale, donation, or conveyance of bison to a governmental or nonprofit organization within or outside of the state of Minnesota uh, when it would benefit the state's natural resources or bison management. Our bison are considered a state asset, and as such, we are currently unable to convey to organizations outside of the state of Minnesota. Animals are covered and conveyed and transferred to manage populations and support gener diverse genetics, which provides a, for healthier populations as our state parks participate in the conservation of bison nationally. Section four and five of the bill would prohibit the release of endangered and or threatened species and clarify permitting requirements for imported endangered and threatened species. It would also explicitly include threatened species along with currently uh, outlined endangered species and its statutory pro protections aligning with current regulations. Section four will clearly prohibit the release of endangered or threatened species. The proposal would clarify permitting requirements for imported endangered and threatened species. The intent of those changes is to prevent impacts to Minnesota resident endangered species due to introduction of disease or non-native genetics of imported individuals. Section six allows for the relief program to provide grant and technical assistance to support new and emerging urban and community wood utilization efforts, reducing wood waste. The increased volume of dead and damaged trees due to pests like emerald ash borer, tree diseases, and more frequent high intensity storms is presenting a management challenge for communities across Minnesota. Urban and community wood utilization focuses on diverting wood waste into beneficial, beneficial reuses, thereby reducing waste and maintaining stored carbon. 
Section 7 removes the seedling production cap and Section 8 allows the DNR State Forest Nursery to grow and sell both bare root and tree, bare root and plug seedlings. Seedlings mitigate and adapt to climate change, enhance habitat and recreation, and perpetuate the state's diverse forests. The State Forest Nursery is currently the only large-scale commercial producer of conservation-grade bare root tree seedlings in Minnesota. Minnesota statutes currently cap nursery seedling production at 10 million seedlings per year and limit the sale of to only bare root <laughs> seedlings. However, over the next two decades, an estimated 30 to 40 seedlings are needed annually to maintain healthy and diverse forests. Uh, Section 9 of the bill uh, extends the Mineral Courting Committee. It's a, a multi-agency committee established in 1987 uh, charged with planning for diversified mineral development in the state. This proposal would extend the work of this committee from 2026 to 2036, extending the committee's authorization will allow the ongoing coordination between the members of this committee. Section 10, 11, and 12 cl provide clarity regarding how to define malicious intent when enforcing a provision from last session that intended to double fines for animals killed with malicious intent. You all may recall the example from Ely where a person intentionally hit three deer with his car. Currently, there is not an interpretation of what is considered malicious intent in law since the term is not defined. These provisions will connect the DNR's Game and Fish Laws of Chapter 97A to current law regarding the mistreatment of animals. And, uh, Section 13 ensures that the DNR's Game and Fish Laws, uh, the restitution value is doubled when a person injures, kills, or possesses an animal in violation of these malicious intent provisions. Uh, finally, Section 14 would correct an unintended fee change passed during the 2023 legislative session by creating a separate application fee for water use general permits that would, should not have been subject to the 2023 fee increases. As passed last session, the fee for a water use general permit now exceeds the cost of some individual permits. General permits are intended to be less expensive than individual permits reflecting the reduced labor involved and generally lower resource impacts. This would provide a separate application fee for water use general permits set at $100. The 2023 general permit fee increased from $100 to $400 would be retained for public water permits while restoring the prior fee structure for water use permits. These changes are consistent with the intent of last year's budget proposals and the associated fiscal analysis. Uh, this concludes my comments on the bill. Thank you for the opportunity to present before you today. I'm available to stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll go to member discussion. First on my list is Representative Pinky. Thank you, Chair Jordan and uh, Representative Hansen and um, Director Waters, is that right? Government Relations Unit Supervisor. Yeah, 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 <laughs> sorry. I always like to use titles, but I never know what they are. Anyways, I appreciate, I appreciate this. I was. Just like to check in about section six with the, the relief program, um, specifically about you spoke about the utilization yeah. um, and the ways to divert that wood waste stream. I was just wondering if you could give a few examples of what those utilizations look like. Adam. Unit supervisor, uh, no, <laughs> Mr. Waters. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Pinky. Hey, I'll work on my title someday, but uh, thank you for the question. Um, so currently, a lot of our wood waste is being taken uh, or utilized, not utilized. So this provision would allow for the actual utilization, providing tree, uh, this lumber for desks, anything that um, the manufacturing industry would like to use it for. Um, it just provides another option of ways that we can use this wood into the future. Um, so we're really looking to be able to utilize in um, meaningful ways. Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm concerned about what we're going to do with all the EAB that we need to yeah. utilize or burn or whatever. Um, so I would be interested to just have future conversations about how that utilization process goes, right? Are people interested? Are we, are we doing that? How much of what the volume of that utilization versus disposal is? Um, so we, we're going to have to think about how to legislate this more in the future of what to do with all of this EAB. So I'd be, love to have any follow-up as that goes forward. Thank you, Chair. Further discussion to the bill. Uh, Representative Hansen, any closing comments? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, look forward to laying this over. Uh, we'll have continual discussion, probably some additional amendments. Uh, Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 3418, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. The bill is laid over. Next on the list is House File 4698. Representative Purcell, would you like to make a motion to move House to would you like to lay make a motion to move House File 4698 be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill? Yes, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, and Representative Purcell, I believe you have an A1 author's amendment. Would you like to move this amendment and explain it briefly? Uh, so moved, Madam Chair. It's a very brief uh, amendment. It just changes the word commissioner to board. Uh, Representative Purcell moves the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form she would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. <laughs> Representative Purcell, to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Chair Jordan. I'm happy to present House File 4698, which would require an Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS, for livestock projects over 10,000 animal units. I'll start out by acknowledging a simple idea that I believe to be true. 10,000 animal units is big. If we're talking about a dairy, which is the case in Minnesota, that's roughly 7,000 cows at a single site. That's a lot of cows. For reference, the average size dairy, according to the last egg census, was less than 400 cows. This scale of development is also largely new to our state with one entity seeking to expand well above the threshold, an application of more than 21,000 animal units um, contemplated here in the state uh, before session. I'm bringing this bill forward because it's past time to have an updated conversation about permitting livestock projects on the scale. In the late 1990s, this body debated our feedlot permitting rules. I think it's fair to say that when we had that debate, many didn't anticipate this size of projects that we are permitting in Minnesota today. As any farmer will tell you who was involved in those conversations, 1,000 animal units, maybe 2,000, was considered a very large operation. Now, more than two decades later, we're discussing potential additional checks on operation with 10,000 or more animal units. I have a deep concern for the remaining family dairies across our state who are in crisis, getting paid below their cost of production. And while they get squeezed, the largest operator in our state continues to expand. The latest ag census shows that between 2017 and 2022, we lost 40% of our dairy farms. And the size of dairy herds increased 67% in that same five year period. Societally, we have incentivized dairy farmers to go big or get out. But let's also make sure we're protecting drinking water, runoff and manure management nearby these enormous operations for their rural neighbors. For some small and mid-sized dairies, I think those families have valid questions about equity when they're subject to the same level of scrutiny as for far larger projects. The MPCA already has authority to require an EIS for large livestock production, and this would take away that discretion just for the very largest of projects. Projects of this scale have the potential to have an outsized effect on our, env our environment, and I think it's worth a conversation today about whether they deserve an additional level of review. Thank you, and I'd be glad to turn it over for the testifiers. First on my list of testifiers is Gary Wardish, Minnesota Farmers Union. Welcome to the committee. Uh, feel free to get settled, then please state your name for the record and proceed. Okay. Thank you, Chair Hansen and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Gary Wordish. <clears throat> Gary Wordish, and I'm president of the Minnesota Farmers Union. I'm here to share my support for Rep Representative Purcell's bill to require, require an EIS for livestock projects over 10,000 animal units. This is not a position that our organization came to lightly or something I just decided being I'm the president. As you can see, it puts us at odds with some other organizations in the agriculture space who we work with closely on a, num on a number of other, other issues. 
This comes not just from our policy, but also an extensive conversation about this proposal at our full board meeting in February, where our county presidents from across the state discussed the proposal before you today. Some of the opposition you'll hear references economic development. And I want to be clear that our organization cares about that deeply. That's one of the primary reasons that Minnesota or Farmer National Farmers Union, which Minnesota Farmers Union is a part of, was founded over 100 years now. That said, we feel our communities, our state, and farmers would be better served by development that's more distributed. In agriculture, more diversification makes farmers and local communities more resilient. That said, there's no question that our dairy industry is rapidly consolidating. From 2017 to 2022, we lost 40% of the dairies, mostly small, in mid-sized operations, and that's a big loss for our communities. But we didn't lose any cows. We lost farmers. As a family farmer myself, I think farmers, we all love agriculture. I raise animals all my life, still do. I think people are more important than animals. We do have to treat the animals well, we all know that. Those animals got consolidated into much larger operations and we have an interest in making sure our permitting is keeping up. As someone in those conversations in the 90s and early 2000s, I can say then that nobody was thinking about dairies were 10 or 20,000 animal units. Whether this is economic development that benefits the state or local communities, that can be, that can be debated. But this committee is the environment, environment and natural resources, and those issues need to be discussed. When our board met on this, they discussed a couple of key concerns. First, wanting to make sure that these projects have the water that they need to operate sustainably. Livestock projects draw water year round, and so we want to make sure we're stewarding that shared resource and making sure it's sufficient for neighboring farms. Second, a livestock operation this size creates a lot of animal waste, and as a farmer myself, that's a very valuable resource as a fertilizer resource. We have to make sure they have an environmental plan to manage that. Our members do have questions about what a natural disaster, emerging animal disease, a human disease that affects workers, or other disruptions would mean for such a large operation. And finally, as I mentioned, I think more about the social and economic effects that are more fully addressed in an EIS. This is a timely discussion, and we're committed to being part of it. Thanks to Chair Hansen, Chair Hansen for having this conversation and to Representative Purcell for bringing this proposal forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list is Darren McBeth, Minnesota Milk Producers Association. Welcome to the committee. When you get settled, please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, committee. My name is Darren McBath, and I'm here representing the Minnesota Milk Producers Association, and we'd like to share some concerns with House File 4698. First, I want to emphasize that the Minnesota Milk Producers Association is a 100% dairy farmer governed organization, and its dairy farmer members represent two thirds of the milk produced in the state, which goes predominantly to dairy cooperatives uh, and processing plants that they own to make cheese, whey, and milk powder. The Minnesota Milk Board is comprised of dairy farmers whose operations are of all sizes. They unanimously oppose the bill and unanimously echo an all the above sentiment for laws and policies to help and encourage dairy farming of all sizes. Now for three cautions against the approach to this bill. First, there's really no correlation between large or even very large dairy farms and average or small size dairy farms in terms of one threatening the other's existence or competing for prices and services. In fact, there's a strong economic argument, as was alluded to just by the previous testifier, that regional presence of large dairy helps smaller farms by solidifying access to veterinary care, nutritionists, technicians that service milking parlors and equipment, and trading in genetics, calf raising, manure handling, etc. Secondly, in terms of environmental considerations and safeguards, all dairy operations under their general permit governed by the MPCA and EPA are required to have zero discharge in terms of their manure lagoons and any runoff from freestyle buildings. The EAW process, our environmental review law, is very robust and requires public input and a mandatory EIS really adds nothing other than significant delay and significant expense. 
Additionally, as was mentioned earlier, the NPCA already has the authority to require an EIS if warranted, and furthermore also has the authority to require unique environmental <coughs> protection stipulations as a part of an individual NPDES permit that goes above and beyond the general permits requirements. Third and finally, and perhaps most importantly, the Minnesota Milk Board is concerned with the message this type of approach sends to the struggling dairy industry. Yes, dairy farm numbers continue to drop. We hate that. And dairy farm sizes do continue to increase. And while it's unlikely most current medium-sized Minnesota dairy farmers would grow to be over 10,000 animal units, it's not unlikely that two or three existing dairy farm families operating on separate sites may want to combine enterprises in the future and be of this size to be more efficient. And let's not forget, Minnesota is a great state for dairy, where we have ample moisture for corn silage, soybeans, alfalfa, abundant groundwater, rich soils, and aging uh, but important processing infrastructure. To say to a dairy enterprise from another state or western Minnesota that has seen its share of dairy expansion in the last 20 years that you're not welcome in Minnesota would be sending the wrong message at a time when our farmer-owned dairy processing plants are already struggling with what the future holds. Thank you for bringing this bill forward and for the discussion. Thank you for your testimony. Next on my list is Lauren Dower, Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair Jordan, members of the committee. My name is Lauren Dower with the Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation. On behalf of our 30,000 farmers and rancher members uh, across the state, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify in opposition to House File 4698, legislation that, re that would require an environmental impact statement for livestock projects over 10,000 animal units. As evidenced by consistent reporting they do with current regulatory frameworks, Farm Bureau members of every size and style take their role as environmental stewards seriously. This, the existing framework, we believe, addresses the environmental concerns of larger <laughs> farms. Currently, the MPCA commissioner can determine whether a formal environmental impact statement is necessary after reviewing submitted environmental assessment worksheets. Um, all farms that wish to expand over a thousand animal units are required to fill out this worksheet, setting a mandatory environmental impact statement uh, precedent for specific farm sizes would deter future growth of family farms, uh, which look to expand uh, to help multiple generations in agriculture. We recognize the concerns of large farms on the environment and believe in the value of competition in the marketplace. The economic impact of growth and opportunity these farms bring to their local communities cannot be understated. Uh, requiring an additional assessment to an already robust regulatory framework can be hurtful, not just to farms who possibly expand the size proposed in the bill, but also the smaller operations around them. We are concerned with the under, unintended consequences of the legislation before you today. Uh, but we are willing to continue conversations with the bill author to find ways to improve the environmental review process. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify on this bill? With that, we will go to member discussion. First on my list is Representative Jacob. Uh, thank you, Chair Jordan. Uh, Representative Purcell, so before I heard you speak about the proposal, I thought this was probably about additional regulations or protections, but when I, what I heard from you is this is more about a defense of small and medium-sized farms, to, and this is being a method to prohibit large farms. Is that what I'm gathering? Representative Purcell. Um, n not exactly. Um, I guess my take on this is... Uh, what we're talking about with 10,000 animal unit and larger is quite a different thing altogether. And so um, what a, a herd of, of 1,000 animal units versus a herd of 10,000 animal units, the fact that they're subjected to the same level of environmental review right now um, doesn't seem right. So that those still decent sized, but um, considerably smaller operations, 1,000 or more, that are required to do the environmental assessment worksheet, that seems insufficient for these, quite frankly, newer uh, size of operations that we're talking about, 10,000 or more animal units. 
Representative Jacob. Thank you for that explanation. I did use to dairy, so I have some dairy background. My county, Winona County, has a large dairy ban. And what has happened in Winona County is two things. A, a dairy will either fragment and work on multiple locations, uh, or they'll leave our county entirely. So when they talk about increased dairy numbers or reduced numbers of farmers and increased dairy numbers, it, it breaks my heart as a county commissioner all those years to read the newspaper newspaper articles where the, where the cows are leaving our county and going to other counties. So what I would see happening with this EIS would be the cows will probably leave our state and go to other states. So my question for you is when a dairy animal leaves the state, what goes with it is the alfalfa that it consumes. The alfalfa is one of the best things we have for our environment. Uh, it stabilizes the soil, filters the groundwater. So w what's your solution when we drive animals from the state and we increase our row crop and anhydrous uh, ammonia application? Representative Purcell. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Representative Jacob. I don't know that alfalfa is one of the best. It is certainly uh, an important tool in the toolbox, and uh, I, I think it's great to grow alfalfa in the rotation. Um, we know that there's more plants as far as if we're looking at water quality and carbon sequestration that do more than alfalfa. Um, our task here at the state is to um, be protecting the people in this case, I think uh, the farmers who are often at the front lines of having well water that they can't drink, um, being able to try and, and protect those farm operations. We can only govern for what happens inside our state. I would love if uh, perhaps more of, as you mentioned, that the cows are broken up onto different sites. Um, I have a bill for grants for better manure management that helps everybody in those scenarios. I guess what I'm bringing forth with this bill is that the 10,000 or more animal units is, is a different thing altogether. So um, would love for those animals to stay in our states and with the people like Mr. Wordish talked about to keep our, our small communities vibrant. But as we're in the Environment Natural Resources Committee here, our job we are tasked with taking care of the Environment and Natural Resources for all Minnesotans. Yeah. Representative Jacob. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that explanation. So with the fragmentation of farms, what we've seen in Winona County, the increase to the infrastructure, the, when you don't allow consolidation and the creative answer is I've got to have my 10, I got to have my 30,000 cows in three different locations or my 40,000 cows in four different locations. Now I'm going to be hauling animals back and forth across our highways and roadways, county roads, township roads. This heavy machinery really beats that infrastructure up. Also, it's very difficult to, uh, to no, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of inefficiencies that go with dividing uh, properties up. And then when it comes to managing the compliance, we can definitely, we found in Winona County, one feedlot officer can definitely be much more efficient on a large dairy than they can on 15 small dairies. And much easier to make sure that the large dairy has the number of acres that it takes to put the manure on. And then the large dairy also has the ability to be able to pump that manure through tubing systems. And we've actually been putting in the infrastructure to run those tubes through the roads when we put the roads in in, 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 in Winona County. So can you speak to why you think the inefficiencies of many smaller dairies is going to be better for the taxpayer than um, a, a larger dairy? Representative Purcell. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Jacob. Um, few things, happy to go on the record to say I think we need more county feedlot officers. Um, I think that benefits everyone. Those folks have an incredible amount of knowledge and they really add a lot to our, um, our counties, at least in my experience. Um, I guess I'm less concerned with efficiencies and more concerned with communities. So if we are losing the actual farmers, we're losing the families who send their kids to schools and um, populate our churches and whatnot. Again, this is the Environment Natural Resources Committee. So trying to think about just keeping my comments to this particular silo, but it's all interconnected. So um, yeah, I guess I'm less concerned with um, efficiency as I am with community and we need to have the people that make the community and I am f pretty sure um, as uh, like these numbers the 40 percent decline in um, dairy farms across the state in the 2017 to 2022 year I think Winona County actually gained one and I would be really curious to figure out who that is and talk with them if they felt like they could start a smaller dairy because of the moratorium or who knows, there's a lot of factors around that, but um, your county is actually kind of an anomaly for the state. So I'd be curious to learn about the, um, the factors that made that true. Representative Jacob? You just gained one what? In Representative Purcell? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, gained one dairy farm in the county. Oh. Representative Jacob. Yeah, so I can speak to that. Winona County uh, in recent history was the second uh, largest dairy producing county in the state about uh, in the 10 year ago uh, census, we had fallen to number four uh, and now we're currently at number five, but we might have, somebody might have moved in somewhere along the way, I don't doubt that. <laughs> so. Um, our, our, our prohibition on large dairies has lost dairy overall numbers uh, and we've fallen, our economy has fallen from second to fifth. Representative Gilman. Thank you, this is a great conversation. Um, quick question, so what is the cost and time difference between the EAW and the EIS? Do you, do you know that? Representative Purcell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Gilman. I don't have those numbers uh, directly off my head. It is a substantially uh, lengthier process that involves a lot more community review and input. Representative Gilman. All right, so, um, so pretty much what I'm hearing you say is that you do not know like the, the cost or the length of time. It's a lengthier review, does it take? weeks longer, months longer, that's that's what I'm kind of wondering. Representative Purcell. I'm not sure if um, the EQB or MPCA is here and that they can answer sort of on average uh, that number because I don't know that. Welcome back, Director Johnson. Please restate your name for the record um, and help us out about the difference between an EAW and an EIS. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, for the record, my name is Tom Johnson, Government Relations Director for the MPCA, but I also represent the Environmental Quality Board. Uh, so um, the I don't have these specific numbers in front of me either, but I would just say in the, in the weeks, months, years conversation, certainly an, an environmental impact statement could take up to several years uh, versus a, an EAW, which is a, uh, an initial worksheet to determine um, get a quick review of the uh, the potential environmental impacts, whereas the, the EIS or environmental impact statement is a full uh, review in, in involving an assessment of alternatives, looking at um, environmental, economic, and social impacts, and the inclusion of assessing different mitigation options. So much more thorough review. Representative Gilman. Thank you for that. Um, so then would you say several years versus um, the current situation would also have many more dollars behind that? I mean, like cost difference, how much greater do you think that would be? Director Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Gilman. I would imagine, and I, again, don't ha I'm happy to follow up with the committee with more specific numbers, but um, the cost is, is quite a bit larger. I would imagine. 
Representative Gilman. All right, thank you. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I want to bring it back to waste, so Mr. Oh. Johnson, if you can stay for a, a moment. Um, so 10,000 animal units, how much waste is that compared to uh, a city? Director Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I also do not know, have those numbers on, on off the top of my head, but uh, it's a rather large amount of waste. Director, er, Representative Hansen. So my, I don't have the numbers exact, but it, my understanding is like creating a small city um, for waste. And what what would a city? Let's just say it's a one one to one. What would what if we had ten thousand people? in a city that we just created, what would they have to do for their um, wastewater system? Mm -hmm. Director Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you for the question, Representative. Uh, they would have to build a treatment facility, get a permit from the, from the agency, um, and generally abide by those permit conditions. Representative Hansen. And they'd have to probably tax themselves to pay for that wastewater treatment facility, correct? Director Johnson. Madam Chair, that, that is correct. Thanks. And Representative Purcell, you had something to add? Um, also, uh, cities of that size have to have a MS4 permit as well for stormwater runoff in addition to um, wastewater. Thank you. Representative Edelson. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm from Edina. I represent Edina. Obviously, we have no farms in Edina, but I guess I'm really surprised the review process. Um, 300, then 1,000, and then dot, 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 that covers all the way up to thousands. I, I work at a lot in healthcare, and that's unheard of. So, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm very concerned. I had no idea, um, quite frankly, because I don't represent farms. Um, that this is going on. So I actually, thank you, Chair Hansen, I have a great deal of concern about the impact. And so the cost of, of, of what it is, is costing our state is high. And so I'm, I would, I'm very supportive of the EIS and, and thank you for bringing this bill and bringing attention to this. I'll be talking about it. Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair Jordan and Representative Purcell for your bill. Sorry, I'm right in between the microphones. Um, I appreciate this bill. I, I wanted to just share a couple of thoughts, but I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask you. How many, you may have stated this, but how many dairy, um, industrial dairy farms, which is kind of what we're talking about, of 10,000 people or 10,000 animals or more. I don't, I personally don't love the phrase animal units. I prefer animals. Uh, how many of those do we have? Representative Purcell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Finke. They're not exactly a one-to-one -one ratio for animals to animal units, which oh, is why we use that term. Um, there are um, nine facilities currently. Um, however, the bill is not retroactive, so it would only apply if um, any of these facilities or any facility wanted to add an additional thousand animal units on top um, or a new uh, operation coming in that's 10,000 or higher animal units. Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair. So the, the existing 10,000 animal unit dairy operations currently would not be subject to any change. And are there more of these on the way? Representative Purcell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Finke. Um, this is sort of new to our state. This seems like as we have been encouraging consolidation in all of our um, sectors, uh, agriculture is no exception to that. So we are really seeing um, folk, dairies really having to get big or get out. So um, likely, and as I mentioned in my opening, um, one of these locations had um, applied to have more than 21,000 animal units. Mm -hmm. Representative Finke. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and Representative Purcell for your answer. So, um, you know, I, like Representative Edelson, I don't, I don't, I mean, I have, actually, I do have a farm in my district because I have the uh, St. Paul University uh, egg farm, but I don't represent farmers. I get that. Um, but 
like the first testifier, you know, every single member of my family used to be a dairy farmer. Um, now zero of them are. Uh, the, the, there are a lot of things that are concerning about this bill, but I think one of the ones that I, I have been thinking about throughout this conversation is that um, the conglomeration of resources and corporate power is destroying America. <laughs> I mean, it is literally, we are putting all of our resources into fewer and fewer mega corporate. These are gigantic in industrial spaces. If you are building a small building, you have fewer permit needs than if you are building US Bank Stadium. That's just true. Why would we possibly say one th a building that is 10 times larger with 10 times the amount of waste and the amount of needs should under undergo the same permit review, that, that would be nonsense. We had a huge committee argument about whether or not to EIS buildings in a city. These are just as industrialized as space. And it's, it's, it's just what we are talking about when we are talking about 10,000 animal unit dairy farms. We're not talking about dairies in the sense of what my grandfather's farm that I spent years of my life on. We're talking about industrial corporate projects that need to be treated like industrial corporate projects. Thank you. Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Maybe uh, Mr. Johnson could come back. And so I just wanted to kind of like focus back on the conversation of just being more grounded. So Mr. Johnson, can you just tell us what is uh, EIS again, and you know, why do we have environmental reviews? Director Johnson. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Lee. Yes, uh, so the um, environmental assessment worksheet, um, what, the, what will be done for a project is to review essentially whether or not an environmental impact statement is needed. And so that is that, that quick, uh, rapidly assess the environmental effects. Um, that might be associated with a proposed project is I think the term that is on the EQP website. Um, but the once it's determined that an environmental impact study needs to be done, um, the requirements are uh, first in a, a, a scope, some scoping to, and then an assessment of alternatives, the environmental, economic, social impact of the project, and then again, the, the alternatives that could be done to mitigate those issues. Um, and then uh, really were the, the main differences here are the need to wrap in that, um, the alternatives assessment and then also the economic and social impacts which are not in the environmental assessment worksheet, that initial review. Representative Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so uh, uh, this process, is it actually an approval process or is this more information gathering? Director Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, certainly it is a, um, it is more of an informational gathering uh, process. Right, and uh, you know, thank you for that, Mr. Johnson. Representative and, Lee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, sorry about that. And you know, I, I think that why I'm asking is that we should be grounded that, you know, these are not to deny any projects or anything like that, but really look at the impact to our environment. Yeah. And you know, the, thank you, Mr. Johnson, and you know, I'm on the NPCA's website, and you know, it talks about how the EAWEIS looks at the potential effects on air, land, and water resources and ways to reduce negative environmental impacts. And so when we have these projects that if they, you know, to the earlier discussions, if they want to leave Minnesota, then we also have to ask, or, you know, maybe they should ask themselves, why are they leaving Minnesota? Are they going to impair our air, water, and land that they don't want to work with our state agencies, our regulatory agencies to go through that process to make sure that they minimize the impact to the state of Minnesota and our natural resources. Because I think, you know, just to be clear again, you know, Mr. Johnson and the NPCA say on their website, this is not a process to deny or approve anything. It's to gather information about the impact that will happen to our natural resources. And so I just wanted to put that on the record and thank you, Rep Representative Purcell, for bringing this forward. Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Purcell, for bringing this forward. Um, 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Lee. You hit on a number of things. Uh, one of the things I did want to put out is that this does not mean, as you said, it's going to be denied. It's going to also take a look at each location. You might find some locations where they're going to find out this is going to work, depending how it's going to impact on the resources and the surrounding environment. So there's no guarantee it's going to be denied. What they may do is say, here, if you're going to do it, here are the things you need to keep in mind. And this goes back to what I some of the conversation earlier when we take a look at the volume of what may happen is your typical cow produces about 65 pounds of manure a day. Your typical human produces less than a pound. So when you start taking a look at the scale of the difference one to 65, that is very massive. And want to make sure that whatever environment we set this up and it's gonna be successful. And I could see it being different, say down in the karst region where you can have holes open up all of a sudden. You know, the last thing I want is to have a whole lot open up under one of these large facilities, that may not be the area, but you'll have other places maybe up north where you're on granite, that may not be the same concern. So I'm just saying, it's not gonna, it's not necessarily gonna stop any, we'll make sure that they're located in the right location with the right source resources so that they'll be successful. And, and the reason it's important that we do this right is because there are gonna be other parts of the country where you've got large factory farms right now where they've got water concerns. They don't have enough water. You've got cattle being raised now out in the desert. Those places right now are looking to relocate elsewhere where they are water rich environments like ours. I think over time, we're not necessarily gonna see a loss. We're gonna see more coming back in, but making sure we're doing it in a way that's gonna be responsible to our environment. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna need Mr. Johnson. Representative Heinzman. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Director Johnson, so I feel like we're, we're missing something in this discussion, and, and maybe you could help shed some light on what the differences are between what's being proposed versus a full-blown EIS. Director Johnson, oh, go ahead. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what's being proposed in the bill versus a full-blown, yeah, I think the, the bill is proposing that at a threshold of 10,000 animal units or more, a full-blown EIS is, is required. Thank you. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Johnson, so I'm, 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 I'm actually hoping that you could explain for our benefit and maybe the public as well, if they haven't lost interest at this point, um, the differences between the current process, mm. okay, and what's being proposed in the bill. What's being proposed in the bill is a full-blown EIS, right? Okay, so I think that if we're, we're not careful, we're gonna leave some folks thinking uh, that the current process is horribly deficient. And if that's the case, Maybe understanding the differences between the two might be, might be helpful. And then for those that are, are, are at least assuming that MPCA is monitoring these things, it might be helpful you know, to understand, wait a minute, there is something here under current law. Um, maybe that could be a part of the explanation, the discussion. Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate that clarity, uh, Representative Heinzman. So, the current process, as I think the bill author laid out some of this, there, there are uh, mandatory thresholds for uh, completing an environmental assessment worksheet. And uh, I believe that's uh, at a, uh, 301,000 animal units. Uh, and so that, that creates the requirement that a project proposer would have to go through that EAW process, which is usually within that about a 90 day um, period where uh, a, an assessment is done of what potential um, environmental impacts there could be. And that, that information gathering process as Representative Lee uh, indicated is really to inform uh, a future permitting approach either for the local government or for uh, the agency as it, as it might be appropriate and um, so as part of that EAW, that environmental assessment worksheet process, at the end of that, the MPCA could decide, the commissioner could decide that an environmental impact statement would be, could be necessary. 
Um, in some of these cases, the MPCA has uh, indicated to a project proposer that they may wish to do an, a voluntary environmental impact statement. You know, so there, there, it's it's definitely something where the um, where we're we are continuing to gather information in the environmental review process. Whether it goes up to that uh, higher EIS process is a decision that happens um, at the end of the EAW. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Parcell, it sounds to me like the opportunity for an EIS already exists. And when it's found that that is necessary, it can already be triggered. It, quite honestly, uh, I, I think that it sounds like our current process is somewhat exhaustive. If it's not, um, I would like to hear if MPCA feels the current environmental review process is appropriate or do we need to add something somewhere in between or do we really need to force anyone in this particular category outlined in the bill into a full-blown EIS every time? Representative Purcell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Lead Heinzman, for the question. So yes, right now um, an EIS can be conducted and um, when I talked to uh, my co-author over in the Senate, um, he referenced some lawsuits. So part of bringing this forward is also to uh, get ahead of that and say, you know what, we just have this threshold. So if you're gonna be of a certain size, you have to do this level of review instead of these operations coming into communities, the communities feeling like they have no tools except to go to the courts and then to uh, sue the private company, the MPCA, I'm not sure whom, but to better outline and get to exactly what you what you alluded to and what Representative Finke alluded to, which is the, the scope of the project needs to match the level of uh, investigation. Representative Heinzman? Nothing further. Representative Purcell, any closing comments? Um, thank you for the opportunity to present House File 4698. It's a significant proposal. Um, I thank you for all of your attention and for the conversation around this. I'm eager to keep working on it and I'm happy to meet with folks who have concerns. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Purcell renews her motion that House File 4698 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. The bill is laid over. Members with no more bills before the committee, we are adjourned. Oh, was there? No. There is a, I've been informed there is a correction to the minutes. Uh, Representative Hansen, would you like to move the correction to the minutes? I would move the correction that uh, the minutes that were previously adopted, uh, March 20th is March 19th. And then uh, where it says Representative Purcell moved the minutes from March 19th, that was March 13th. So I would uh, What about the name? recall oh, got, and- Get the name. You got Schultz on there. And Isaac Schultz is no longer uh, a member of members I think we'll just rescind that earlier motion and we'll make another new yeah. motion on the amendments tomorrow um, any further business from the committee uh, uh, tomorrow so uh, madam Whenever. chair we will be meeting on Friday morning uh, there will be two bills that will be heard um, and I want to be clear in my language the one bill is a Senate file <laughs> policy bill on uh, with some items that we have heard, items that are in that policy bill to lead off uh, were heard in this committee previously. However, we also heard a policy bill today um, and we heard a game and fish bill today and we are going to hear a vehicle financial bill on Friday. Uh, so I don't think it would be, I know members have concerns about going home. Uh, I don't think it's in the morning. I don't think it will be too long, we can correct the minutes there, uh, but that's the intent uh, for that uh, uh, simple policy bill, uh, which is a Senate file. And now, members, we are adjourned. <laughs>